Hey, welcome to Discover Point. We're glad you're joining us today from wherever you're at, be it your living room, your bedroom, even your kitchen where you're having a cup of coffee. I am so glad that you've joined us today as we continue our series out of the book, The Gospel of Mark. We continue our series, Christ's Power Over Our Every Need. Grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and let's hear what God has to say today. In the week one, when Jeremy began, he asked the question, what are your symptoms? And he talked about Jesus' popularity going viral quicker than any pandemic that we're in the midst of right now. And then he asked a question that really caused me to think and, and how I respond in our community. He said, are you asymptomatic? And I went, wow. I'm a believer, but do people know? Christ has power in my life so that I can allow people to know. And then last week, Dr. Bumpers talked about the condition of the soil and from the parables and the soil being our heart. And he asked us, what is the condition of the soil of your heart? Man, I began to think about that and how out of our heart everything comes. And this week, I want to talk about Jesus' power over our doubt. I believe doubt is something that we all struggle with at some point in time in our life or maybe even today. And, and there was a time when doubt really just almost overwhelmed me. Back in December of 1977, my father had to go into the hospital for a series of tests. And he hadn't been feeling well for several months. And he'd been diagnosed with various acute illnesses. And nothing seemed to, happen, seemed to work. Treatments just didn't change the way he was feeling and so he went to the hospital and after several days of test we were called <clears throat> to come to the hospital and I remember that night very well I don't really remember the day but I remember the night I remember sitting outside the hospital room as my mom went in with the doctor and my dad's best friend was out in the hallway with myself and my sister and my mom and my dad were receiving the diagnosis together and I heard a, a cry, almost a yelp, from my mom. And she came out and she called my sister and I in, and we were told at that time that my father had been diagnosed with the advanced stages of lung cancer. Man, I began to question everything. I had driven myself to the hospital, and on the ride home, just doubt just began to creep into my mind, doubting God, asking why. Not knowing. I remember getting home and going to the shower and just turning it on and sitting down in the shower floor and just weeping, questioning my very existence. Everything that I ever knew, doubt just creeping and just covering me, doubting everything. Doubt is real. Doubt can be a powerful force in our life. And the question I want to ask is, will we seek Jesus in the doubt. Will we seek Jesus in our doubt? It may surprise you to know that some of the strongest characters in the Bible struggled with doubt. We have this image of, per per of perfect characters of faith that never wavered in their faith, not even once, but that's just not true. Thomas asked to see and touch the scars in Jesus' hands. Peter denied Jesus three times. And John the Baptist, while sitting in a prison cell, sent messengers to Jesus asking, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall, shall we look for another? See, John was going through an intense time in his life, being in prison for speaking out against a corrupt king. He was facing certain death, and in the midst of this trial, John doubted. The very one who prepared said, Prepare the way. He doubted the goodness of Jesus and whether he was truly the Messiah. So he reached out to Jesus. He was probably feeling forgotten and alone. And it was hard to see the goodness or the existence of Jesus while he was in chains. When I received my father's diagnosis, that's where I was at. I was feeling abandoned, alone, forgotten. And it may even shock you to know that even the disciples doubted. This brings us to our passage today. It's a very familiar passage, it's Mark 6, the 30th verse through the 44th verse. We're only going to focus on a couple, but it's the feeding of the 5,000. <clears> See, the disciples had just returned from being sent out. 
They had returned from their mission work and they were telling Jesus all that they had done and all that they had seen and all that had been accomplished in his name. And Jesus wanted to go to a quiet place and rest. And the crowds hearing this followed them. And Jesus, as always, with the compassion he had, he, he began to teach them. Which brings us to the portion of the scripture that I want us to focus on today. Mark 6, the 35th verse through the 37th verse. Late in the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. But Jesus said, You feed them. With what? they asked. We'd have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. With what? They doubted. With what? The disciples wanted to send the people away to get food. Jesus said, you feed them. With what? The disciples doubted. Jesus knew. Do you have doubts? What are they? And if they exist, are you seeking Jesus in the doubt? Doubt takes many forms. The enemy loves to sow seeds of doubt in our minds to turn from Christ. But fortunately, we have a patient God, a God that is willing to walk through the doubt with us. And there are at least three kinds of doubt that can creep up behind us that I want to talk about today, that can crawl into our minds and cause a great deal of suffering. But recognizing these doubts is our first steps to confronting them. But before we jump into these doubts, let me, let me explain something. Doubt is different than unbelief. Doubt is very different than unbelief. When we doubt something, if you're like me, you begin to question. You begin to ask questions. You begin to search and to seek out. And many times in our questioning, particularly when it comes to faith, we only evolve into a deeper faith as our questions are answered. So what are the three areas of doubt that we want to speak to today? I want to speak to the doubt in God's existence. I want to speak to the doubt in God's goodness. And I want to speak to our own self-doubt. So let's begin with God's existence. This is one of the most common areas or common doubts. Books, movies, documentaries have spent a lifetime trying to dismantle the existence of God. It can be a struggle for us to wrap our heads around an all-knowing, omniscient, uh, benevolent, eternal creator. It's a struggle. Even as believers, if we're a believer, we can struggle with this and much more as we ask questions about creation, the virgin birth, and even the miracles that we read about. But we must concede the following. If we think, if we as humans think we can wrap our minds around an all-knowing, omnipresent, omnipotent creator of space and time, then we sorely overestimate our ability to understand. But there's hope. Take heart. God has not left us in the dark. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 shares that with us, but I really just want to read the 15th verse. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Although God is mysterious, he's relational. He created us to be in relation with him. That means he wants to be known, and he has made a way in many ways for us to know him. The main way is through Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. God chose to reveal himself through Jesus. And by knowing Jesus, we can know God. And this may be where you're at. And I want you to look. If you look at your screen, there should be a number that you can text the word follow to. And I want to stop just for a brief moment and ask you if you're ready to make a decision. If you don't know God, if you don't know Jesus, if you doubt their existence, I want to give you an opportunity right now to accept and to know that God exists. All you have to do is acknowledge your sin, believe that Jesus died on the cross, was raised on the third day, and is alive and lives forevermore, and then confess that he is Lord and Savior over your life. If you will do that, and follow me in this prayer and text follow. Holy God, we admit that we are sinners. Father God, we believe that Jesus died for us. He died on the cross and rose on the third day and he lives today. And we confess with our tongue and believe in our heart that he is Lord. If you prayed that, then you should no longer doubt that God 
exists, that Jesus exists, he's come into your life and he will make changes. It may not be immediately, but he will make changes. In my own personal life, God made himself known to me in a very real way. Through my father's diagnosis, through living with him, through cancer, through treatments, it was, it was a difficult time. And he died unexpectedly about 18 months after his diagnosis. And it was sitting at his funeral when I was surrounded by family and friends and people who loved and cared and were reaching out. I was still feeling alone and forgotten and questioning the very existence of God and why I was here. And it was at a point in the funeral that God made himself known to me. I literally felt his touch and heard his voice speak to me. And he says, it's going to be okay I'm here and I knew at that moment that I only had arrived at that point because God existed and had been with me every step of the way God exists you may still have those doubts but he exists but if you know God exists and you're a believer or even if you're not a believer and and, and you still believe that God exists or if God does exist you may have doubt in God's goodness and you may ask the question, if God is good, then why? You know, I ask, if God is good, then why my father's death at such an early age? He was only 40 years old in the prime of his life with a family. If God, you're so good, why? And even today, we may be asking, God, if you're so good, why Maude Aubrey? God, why George Floyd and countless others? And these are valid questions. They're hard-hitting questions. And these questions and the answers to these questions are rooted in suffering and pain. And, and I understand that and, and I get that. God, if you're so good, then why? See, this was truly the heart of John the Baptist. When he was laying awake in his cell, he was suffering, depressed, and facing death. And it's a lot like that for us. When life doesn't meet our expectations, it forces us to take a step back. And to reevaluate where we're at to ask questions. We ask why. And we seek answers. And here in God's goodness, the answer is similar to the first answer. It's found in Jesus. I know sometimes that sounds cliche but it's the truth. You see, Ahmaud Aubrey and George Floyd were not the results of the absence of good. It was the result of the presence of evil. In a broken world. Let me say that again. Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd were the results of evil. They were not the absence of good. When, even in Jesus' own life, when a good friend passed away, he did not react in an expected manner. He did not raise his voice, call lightning, or revive him from the dead. Nor was he apathetic to the situation. And neither should we be as it relates to our current situation. Jesus wept. We cried. And say this isn't supposed to happen. Suffering and death was never an original part of God's plan. It's the result of a broken world littered with sin. But there's hope. Hope in the fact we have a God who understands and empathizes with our suffering. We have a God who walks with us through the struggle. We have a God who walks with us through the pain of life. And we have a God who is present in the fiery trials of life. We turn to Daniel, the third chapter, the 24th and 25th verse. It says, but suddenly Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in amazement and exclaimed to his advisors, didn't we tie three men up and throw them into the furnace? This is the story of the blazing furnace. Yes, your majesty, we did. Look, Nebuchadnezzar shouted. I see four men unbound walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like a god. This current situation may seem like a fiery furnace. But know that God's goodness is revealed in his nearness. Just as Abednego, Meshach, and Shadrach were in the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar saw a fourth that looked like a god, God was with them walking beside them through that fire. He's walking with us here. And you may ask, well, where is he in all of this? And if we were here in the building today, I would ask you to look to your left and to look to your right. And I would tell you as you look, the people sitting next to you, that's God. He is near. He is in each of us, you and me. Amen? Let me assure you, he's at our side during these times. Going back to my own personal story, God has been at my side every step of the way from the diagnosis 
to the death through my life. I have to reference that on that very moment when I was questioning God's very existence. His goodness even crept into there. He whispered, it's going to be okay. And I can tell you 41 years later, it has been okay. It hasn't always been easy. But it's been okay. He introduced me to my wife who pulled me out of darkness by sharing his love with me through my family and friends and through some of you man that is God's nearness to me that is restored my faith in the goodness of God knowing that when we don't see goodness it's the presence of evil and then it brings us to the doubt that I think many of us struggle with today and it's self-doubt this is the doubt that lingers this is the doubt that can destroy us this is the voice of the enemy whispering you're not good enough. You're going to fail. You're not strong enough. That's the voice of the enemy. That's definitely not the voice of God. Many great heroes of the faith dealt with self-doubt. Moses, Gideon, Peter, just to name a few. However, there's one consistency in their lives. God worked through their doubt and their weaknesses. When Moses doubted his ability to lead, God sent him an aid. When Gideon doubted his strength to fight, God provided an army. And when Peter doubted his worthiness, God provided his spirit. After my father's doubt, I was being told that I had big shoes to fill. As an 18-year-old, I was petrified. I knew what my father had done and was doing. And, and in my eyes, and even in the community, he was a great man. And I knew I couldn't fill those shoes. And the enemy was telling me that I would fail, that I was not equipped, I didn't have the skills, that I would never fill those shoes. And I began to doubt myself and my worth and my character. But God's voice assured me that he, God, had already filled those shoes. He reminded me what he said again. And these words continue to ring true with me today when self-doubt creeps in. I hear those words that he whispered to me on the day of my father's funeral that it's going to be okay that I need to rely on him you see in our doubts and struggles we often hear and this may upset some of you because you may have been guilty of saying this or you may have been told this but in our doubts and struggles when we're talking with our friends and, and people that we're close to they'll say but God will never put more on you than you can handle guess what he absolutely will allow you to go through more than you can handle he absolutely will See, when we hear these things, that's to try and erase self-doubt and put us into self-reliance, not God-reliance. See, if we can handle the situation, then we don't need God. And we need God. Philippians 4.19 tells us, And this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which we have been given to us in Christ Jesus. See, the enemy of, enemy's voice of doubt still whispers to me at times, as I said, you can't do this or you can't do that. I've often heard the voice of discouragement, even in the current times, even as we continue our pastor search, the voice of discouragement, the voice of doubt creeps into my mind from the enemy trying to hold me back. And the answer to that voice is me not trying to convince myself that I am able, but rather I need to remind myself that I need to rely on God and my answers are found in Christ. That I am called by a powerful God, the only God, who is able to work despite my weaknesses. Despite our weaknesses, he will supply the power. And then finally, in 2 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, the 9th verse through the 10th. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I am glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The answer here is we have to know Jesus to overcome self-doubt. We must press into the character of Christ, allowing him to show his goodness, his power, and his presence. As I said earlier, it's been 41 years since my father's death, but just as God promised, he filled those shoes. He has been by my side, and it has been okay. 
When doubt creeps in, that's when I press in to the promise that it's going to be okay. That's when I press in to the promise that God will show me his goodness, his power, and his presence. Jesus has power over our doubt. Jesus had power over the disciples' doubt. Jesus answered to the disciples' doubt their question with what? Jesus said, how much bread do you have? Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 families probably. It says 5,000 men, but we know that they counted the number of men. There were probably closer to twelve to 15,000 people. Jesus had the power over the disciples' doubt to feed 5,000. He has the power to overcome our doubt. What are your doubts? Take a moment and list those doubts if you don't mind as we come to a close and come to our decision time. And our decision is, will you seek Jesus in the doubt? Will you turn to him if you doubt God's existence? You've been given that opportunity, and we're going to pray again in just a moment. Will you seek Jesus when you doubt his goodness? And when self-doubt creeps in, will you seek, seek Jesus? Will you pray with me? Father God, we, we often have doubts. We doubt your existence. We doubt your goodness. Father, we, we doubt ourselves because of the enemy. Father, right now, if I am in the position that I doubt your existence, I want to accept you. Just pray with me if you would. Again, Father, I admit that I am a sinner and in need of a Savior, Father. I believe that you died for my sin, that you rose on the third day and restored my relationship to the Father. And I confess this with my tongue, that you are Lord and Savior. If you prayed that, would you text follow? And guys, I want you to know, I'm glad you were here today and look forward to seeing you next week.